years is it now, Colleen, that we've done so? 16. Um, just every year, you, they, they work so hard to organize this, and every penny comes to um, our project, which um, I, I really do thank you all for doing now, this. Now, as Colleen said, I've been um, studying the Abacelli elephants for coming up to 40 years now, and uh, I've spoken here so many times that I'm not going to give you a general lecture on how elephants live. I'm going to tell you mainly what I'm going to talk about is what's been going on since I last lectured to you, so over the last um, few years, and uh, what, what stories I have to tell you about our elephants. And um, let's see if I can get this to work. Yes. <laughs> I will tell you, it'll give you a little, for those of you who have never uh, seen pictures of Abacelli or know what we're doing, um, it's famous for being under, right under Kilimanjaro, which is to the south of us and across the border into Tanzania. So all the fabulous pictures you see in, in books of, of animals under Kilimanjaro are usually taken in Abacelli. It's, um, it's famous for its wildlife and for its beautiful scenery. It's on the southern border with uh, Tanzania. And it's actually a very small national park. It's only uh, 150 square miles, but the ecosystem over which the animals roam is about 5,000 square miles. So they, they roam all over. Um, they roam really way down into Tanzania and way up and over to here. So they, they need that whole area to survive. Uh, there are presently um, 1,300 elephants, just about, in Ambicelli, and uh, we've been studying them at, for all these years. So every animal is known individually. That's how we've done our project, by following the lives of individual elephants over time. Uh, in the database that we have, there's been a, a, about 2,700 elephants have gone through the population, born and died, and, um, and they're presently 1,300, and they, all of whom are known. And uh, elef there, in, among those 1,300 elephants, there are 62 families and about uh, 300 independent adult bulls. And the families are made up of females and calves, and the females are all related because females never leave the family. So they're, they, they're made up of grandmothers and granddaughters and mothers and daughters and aunts and nieces and sisters and cousins. And each family is led by the oldest female, and we call her the matriarch. It is a matriarchal society. Uh, she is the, uh, the most important uh, part of the family. She's the leader. And she is what we call the repository of knowledge for the family. She knows where all the migration routes are and uh, where to go in time of drought or where to go for water or the best tr fruiting trees. And all that she passes on to her daughters and granddaughters. And an elephant, this is Echo, the famous elephant, and she lived to be 64. And that is um, something around the range that an elephant can live. We don't think it's much beyond 65. So, um, so she has a lot. She had a lot of wisdom in that big head of hers. A lot of things that she remembered over those 64 years that she was able to pass on to her family. She passed. She herself died in 2009. Now, families um, cooperate in in raising calves, and we think that's the main reason that families have, have evolved, that, that uh, small elephant calves are completely vulnerable. They're unable to protect themselves or run fast enough to get away. And it actually takes a whole family to raise a calf, not just a mother. A mother on her own would not be able to fight off the hyenas and lions for long enough. They can always finally get in and get the calf when it's tired. So it takes the, um, the other females and the, 
and female calves, particularly to um, to help take care of uh, the the very young ones. And in this in this photo, uh, this the little calf has had just cried out in for some reason, and all the other this one and all the other its sisters and cousins came running over to to you know to reassure it, and that's very typical behavior in. Um, and one of the reasons why elephants are successful in, the, in that they can cooperate in this way. Now, this is a young male who's who's about in this photo. He's about um, well, ten years old. Now he he will soon be um, sexually mature, around uh, maybe about 11, 12, 13 years old. And, and once he is mature, he'll leave the family. And they, sometimes the females are encourage him to leave, and can, and uh, usually not his own mother, but usually some of the other females might encourage him to leave. But often he just leaves on his own because he he may not have any other male um, young males his own age to play with or to interact with in the family. So he he may just get up and leave and go out into the world. Uh, on his own, and in, in the male world, he, he really needs to spend a lot of time learning and growing. Uh, elephants grow throughout their lifetime, and so the older an elephant is, the bigger it is. And a little 14-year-old male who has just left his family will be, you know, not even half the size of a big adult male. So uh, he, he has to has to have at least 15 years to grow. So there's a lot of, lot of <laughs> waiting around and biding his time before he can, he can begin to compete for, uh, with the other big males. So um, and these are two youngsters, both independent of their families, but they're testing each other's strength. So that a young male will move around a lot, meeting all the other bulls in the population and testing himself against them. And then by the time they're big uh, and, and start coming into must, which uh, is, is a, a cycle that uh, male elephants go through, which, which where they have raised testosterone and they, they're much more aggressive and they fight for females. This is a serious fight between two males. And they're both in must. Um, and they're both surging with testosterone and, and ready to fight to the death if necessary. So that they don't that the most successful males are uh, breeding when they're starting in their well they can start when they're about thirty but it's not until they're in their forties or fifties that they really have success. Now Amboseli is a is an interesting place ecologically. It's um, it's very dry. It's dry savanna. It's called, it's called uh, you know, technically it's called semi-arid savanna. And you can see this dry ground. Um, and even when the first explorers went to Amboseli in the 1890s, they said they they mentioned they described it as a barren wasteland, uh, but uh, with many many much wildlife. And um, and the reason for this being able to have this much wildlife is that it's fed, it's swamps and rivers are fed from underground rivers from Kilimanjaro and they bubble up into springs and and, um, and rivers in the park and then so you get this dry plains and then you get beautiful fresh, very fresh water and this is what is able to uh, attract all the animals and why it seemed so odd to the to Thompson, that first explorer, of why there were so many animals when it, it seemed such a, a dry, barren place. Now, but being a, a semi-arid savanna as it is, it mean, that means that rainfall is very unpredictable, and we get uh, some years we have good rainfall, some years we have terrible droughts, and this is. Um, this is, shows our 41-year average for our, um, for our rainfall. The average rainfall in an a okay year is about um, 340 to 350 mill, millimeters, which is about 13 inches. 
And then in drought years, we get much less. So uh, we've had a series of droughts over the 40 years I've been there. We had one in, we had a, a drought in 74 to 76, and a little, and then we had a really, really terrible drought in starting in 2008 and 2009. And it was the worst drought in living memory. The Maasai people who live around the parks had never seen it. Even the very old men had never seen such a terrible drought as that one was. So that is one of the uh, main things I'm going to talk to you about is, is, the, is what happened during that drought and what's happened since. Now, they're just, as I said, there's water that animals are able to drink, but without rainfall, there's no food, no food grows, so no vegetation grows. So they don't die of thirst in a drought in Amboseli, but they die of hunger. And uh, we lost a lot of animals. It was, it was one of the worst things I've ever been through. In, in 2009, the park was just full of carcasses, and it smelled, and it was depressing. You could drive out, park the car, and there'd be 30 or more carcasses right, right around you, just really close. And it just seemed endless. It just seemed like it was never going to, to go away. And see, you can see how many, how many carcasses there are just in that small area. And this, these were wildebeest died, and zebras died, and the elephants were, you know, they, they got thinner and thinner, and they were just only able to move from one place to another slowly, and moving, in this case, they're moving toward the water to drink that day, but they had, really had very little to eat. And the elephants began to die as well, both um, calves and and adult females, I mean big adult females. And we, we hadn't seen anything like this before. It was very hard to take. And Echo was one of those who died during the drought. And, uh, and to make matters worse, the drought coincided with an upsurge in poaching or a return of poaching. We, we hadn't had poaching in years in Amazonia. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the ban on the international trade in ivory was lifted in 2008, and uh, some of the southern African countries were allowed to sell their stockpiles of elephants that had died naturally or had been or confiscated ivory from poachers. And um, at first, on the first sale that they had, they were being sold just to Japan, and that didn't cause a problem. But then the authorities allowed the sale to go to China, and that has caused a huge, huge problem for us. And um, within a few months of that sale, something like 35 new carbon factories had opened in China, and, and the, 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 the demand for, for ivory was just amazing, because what happened, what happened before, because we'd been through this fight to stop the ivory trade back in the late 80s, and we succeeded. But in those days, the the, uh, the Chinese were the carvers of ivory. They often they were often carved, and they bought the ivory, carved it, and then sent it out to Europe and America and Japan and other parts of the uh, of the Far East. But they didn't buy it themselves. That was during you know communist times. They weren't supposed to have. Um, decorative items, and nobody had the money to buy it anyway. So it, it was, they weren't a big, a big market. But when it opened up again this time, uh, there's a huge market. There's you know millions of people who are, who who are middle class now in China, and they want ivory because in the very old days in China, only the aristocracy, so to speak, was able to own ivory. So it's a, it's a symbol of, of wealth and position to have ivory objects in your home, um, wearing them, whatever. So we're in big trouble.